Yeah. Mrs. Carlin's called four times. Her husband's two months late with their child support again, and your 10 o'clock just walked in. Uh, tell Mrs. Carlin I'll get back to her and show Miss Brodsky in. Yes, sir. Hi. Come on in. Have a seat. Well, I've thought a lot about your situation, and I've decided to take your case. And based on what you've told me, I think we can win. But I just want you to be sure you know what you're getting into. Divorce is a big adjustment for anybody to make. Now, you've been together almost 10 years. It's an awful long time to share a life with someone. So I just want you to be certain that you're ready to throw it all away and be out there on your own. I'm ready, Mr. Hanner. I want to divorce my parents. Tom, I'm standing in front of the Superior Court building in downtown Los Angeles where an anxious crowd is awaiting the arrival of the Brodsky family for the opening day of testimony in this unprecedented child emancipation case. Casey Brodsky, a fourth grade student at Mann Elementary School in West Los Angeles, is attempting to divorce her parents, Lucy Van Patten Brodsky and Albert Brodsky. While Casey is not the first child in the state to seek a divorce, she definitely is the youngest. Divorcing one's parents is legally referred to as the Emancipation of Minors Act. Now, basically, this act says that any minor in the state of California can be divorced from his or her parents if that minor can prove that the emancipation is in their own best interest. And that, of course, is what this trial is all about. Oh, Ms. Brodsky, is it true you were serving your daughter's divorce papers while appearing on the Murph Griffin Show? Well, Brodsky, how do you feel about your daughter asking the court to appoint your housekeeper as her legal guardian? Can I have your autograph? Your book changed my life. Hey, that's a great purse there, Lucy. Where'd you get that? Miss Brodsky, is it true your daughter's asking you for alimony? That, of course, was the plaintiff's mother and the co-defendant in this case, novelist Lucy Van Patten Brodsky. Now, the proceedings are about to begin here at the county courthouse. However, we are still awaiting the arrival of the plaintiff's father, film director Albert Brodsky. Mr. Brodsky? Hi, I'm Alan Sluzer from the Salkin office. I'm going to be representing you on this case. Where's Salkin? Uh, uh, well, Mr. Salkin can't be here. He's going to be busy all week. Wait, he's not coming at all? He's been my lawyer for 10 years. What, suddenly I'm not big enough for him? Oh, shit! We shouldn't have involved you, I know. But dragging us into court? I mean, suddenly we're a media event. Mother, you and Dad for a long time did not recognize my rights as a human being. You both treat me like chattel. You cannot do with me as you please anymore. We have a reconcilable difference. Oh, my God, she's been brainwashed. Are you going to say anything? Casey, are you doing this because your mother's been so insensitive to you? Do you know how not to be a worm? Why you want to divorce your father? I know you never got over his abandoning us. No, Mom, you never got over his abandoning us. Let's not blame this whole thing on me. All Casey needs is a little love from a parent who's not too busy to give it to him. And what do you know about love? I'm a human being too, you know. Since when? Casey. Casey, honey, wait, wait. Listen. Whatever we did to you, we did by accident. We're your parents. Stop this insanity. Come on, don't make us go in there. What do you say? Huh, pal? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth so help you God? I do. Please be seated. Mr. Brodsky, where were you born? Plainfield, New Jersey. You grew up in Plainfield? Went to school there? Yes, 
And then I went on to New York University. And what brought you to California? A job. I got my doctorate in cinema at NYU, and my thesis, Demiological Analysis of the Sexual Overtones in the Early Films of Ernst Lupich, was published, and I was subsequently offered a professorship at UCLA. Is that where you met Ms. Van Patten Brodsky? No. I met her before I came to L.A. On the way out, actually. I had two weeks to kill before classes began. I thought it would be exciting and romantic to hitchhike across the country. Excuse me, can we stop for a minute? Is all this really relevant to my daughter's problem? Finding out what led you to this courtroom is exactly your daughter's problem. Please continue. When did you say you met Miss Van Patten Brodsky? Oh, sorry. I met Lucy in Harmony, Indiana on January 20th, 1973. I had no idea I'd be married to her four days later. Remember me? Mm. I, w I was wondering, would it be possible for you to give me a lift into St. Louis? Or actually, any small town that's got an airport, I've decided to hang up the whole thumb. I mean, it's taken me six days to get through three and a half states. I obviously, obviously, hitchhiking is not my fault. I I'm sure you must, you must have your reservations about picking up strangers, but... Do you speak English? Excuse me, buddy. Oh, thank you oh, very wait, much. Wait, miss, wait. Please, I'm freezing to death. I'm frozen. I can't stay out here anymore. Would you do me this one favor? Look, look at this. I have ID. I'd, I'd show you my license, but I don't drive. Listen, I have a library card. Look, there's a picture. I'm a teacher. You can't get any safer than that. Oh, come on, look, I'll sit in the back. I will make a sound. It's starting to rain. Could you give me a break here? Let me in. Please. God, please. Lady. I'll pay you. Bink, and he has this Bink. thing. Well, his name is Dennis Brinkerhoff, but everybody calls him Bink. He's, he's great, but he has this thing about his car. No food or hitchhikers allowed. He actually had a sign in here that said that, but it kept falling down. Anyway, when you said you were a teacher, I, I figured... Bink likes was, teachers? Uh, yeah. Uh, sure. What do you do? Who? You. Me? Um, nothing. I'm, I'm just engaged. Oh. 
When are you getting married? Actually, I, I write uh, children's stories, but I, I, I don't do it for a living yet. I probably never will. February 14th. Uh, the 8th. The, the 14th. The 11th. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting married in, in San Diego. Bing's uh, stationed there. He's in the Navy. I'm bringing him out his car, and I'm bringing him out me all at the same time. Do you want a cigarette? No, thanks. No, neither do I. So what do you teach? Film. Oh, really? Wow. God, we didn't even have a film department at my school. We didn't have anything at my school. I went to Chatham. That's an all-girls school in Pittsburgh. I'm from Pittsburgh, so don't make any jokes. I happen to love it there. So, um, how do you teach film, anyway? That's all right. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> I, I don't truck. Thank you, please. Come on. Please, please. Honey, the, the twins just threw up all over your grandmother. Oh, good. Uh, thanks. No problem. How you doing? Oh, I like your belt. Emiological analysis of sexual overtones in the early films of... Ernst Lubitsch? What does that mean? MGM, circa 1934, The Merry Widow. We're in the bedroom of King Ahmed and his beautiful young wife, Dolores. Now, King Ahmed was played by George Barbier, who was a 65-year-old, very rotund actor. He's getting dressed to go out. Finally, he finishes, he walks out the door, and there is a very young, handsome captain of the guard. Salutes him with a sword and clicks his heels. Maurice Chevalier. And the captain of the guards watches him walk down the hall and disappear around the corner. And then he slips into the bedroom with the queen. Hmm. All right. Now, meanwhile, the king, he's walking along. And he looks down. He doesn't have his belt. He doesn't have his sword. He's going to have to go back. So the camera pans back with him down the hallway to the doors, but stops at the door. He goes in. The camera stays on the closed doors, right? Beat, beat. What's going to happen? Suddenly, the doors fling open. And it's him. It's the king. He's fine. He walks out. He's got his belt and his sword, and he's putting them on, only this time, they don't fit. They're too small. Oh. <laughs> the Lubitsch oh. touch. <laughs> well, that'll be all for today, class. <laughs> oh, must be great to be so passionate about something. Oh, I'll bet you're a wonderful teacher. <laughs> oh, Illinois. Um, Bink made up these tapes for me. Travel tapes, one for each state. They're really quite helpful. Welcome to Illinois. <laughs> How you doing, peanut head? He thinks I have a small head. Before we get too far into the prairie state, better check your gas gauge. He's probably down to less than half a tank. You'll find an SO station on the north side of the highway at approximately 2,300 hours, if you're still on course. Booked you a room in my name at the Hojo's in Culver. But by the way, an ex-roomie of mine from Annapolis, Kip Harwood, lives in Culver. Kip's a super guy. Give him a jingle if you need anything. Area code 217. Ah, uh, you're right there. You don't need the area code. Look alive, Bink. <laughs> okay. Now, his number's 555-7623. And his wife's name is Corky. Hell of a nice gal. And Luce, if they invite you over, take them something, will you? Spend up to 15 bucks. Nah. Make that 10. We weren't that close, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> Only 11 more days till our wedding. You know the Binker loves you. That was Bink. Mm. He sounded dumb. I know, I know. He's he's very... Oh, what's the word? Um... Uh, domineering? I, I could tell you thought that. No, you don't know him. He's not domineering at all. He's... he's um, he likes things a certain way, you know? When you, when you set the table for him... He likes to line up the bottoms of the knife and the fork and the spoon perfectly. He's, he's, he's very... Compulsive. <sighs> Excuse me, but I don't think you know what you're talking about. No, no, I, I can't wait until we get married. 
I wanted to be a bride all my life. I've got my veil and my gown and the trunk and I... Are you all right? Oh, are you okay? I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to put the bink down. He, he sounds like a terrific guy. Really, he does. Yes, he is. Everybody likes him. He's great. I mean, he knew Illinois was the prairie state. He's in the Navy serving his country. <laughs> Maybe I better get out here. No, no. No, no. Wait, wait, wait. This is not your fault. It's not your fault. It isn't? No. I... <laughs> I do this all the time. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. It's fine. <laughs> Gosh, it was really nice meeting you. And I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you. I mean that. Yeah, well... I'm sorry about that little outburst before. I'm, <laughs> I've been a little nervous lately. Everybody goes through that right before they get married, you know? It's happened to all my friends. I, also, I'm a little cool from the drive. I, I don't like road trips that much, you know? But I was the only one that being trusted with his cars. I just didn't want you to think I was a nut or anything. No, no, it's just... I don't think I should get into it. What? Get into it. Well, I... Don't take this the wrong way, but if if you saw somebody talking about how excited they were to get married and were broken to tears when they were telling you, you just think it was a little fishy, that's all. You have a girlfriend, Albert? No, no, not at the moment. You have a lot of opinions for a guy who never had a girl. I didn't say I never... I knew I shouldn't have said anything. Goodbye. Thanks again for the lift. Good luck in Hollywood. Would you hate it a lot if I gave you a ride all the way to California? married and walked down the aisle arm in 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 arm no 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 i liked it keep going really you have to picture a blank page okay and under it is written, no worm, no bird, no cat, no dog, no person, no house, no tree, no woods, no land, no water, no clouds, no sky, no sun, nothing, no picture. That was fabulous. I love you. I mean, I love them. It's excellent, excellent. I'm not kidding. I think you could get these published. Oh, don't don't start crying again. <laughs> oh, Albert. <laughs> what, why don't you read me another one? Well, okay. Please. Yeah, good. In the spring, to give your heart. A song to sing And then a kiss But more than this I wish you love And in July A lemonade To cool you in 
some leafy glades I wish you health and more than wealth I wish you love my breaking heart and I agree that you and I could never be so with my best my very best I set you free I wish you Wait a minute. If you hadn't talked me into deviating from Bank Safe Plan, that car would still be here. This is not my fault. Fine. Tell Bank that. Yeah, tell him that I was getting drunk on margaritas with a hippie while his car was being stolen. Tell all 245 pounds of him, Bella. Well, I'm not a hippie. misplaced it. You're really stupid, you know that? I bet you don't talk to Bink this way. I don't have to. He doesn't screw anything up. You know, I refuse to take the blame for this. Forget it! I'd like to forget you. How's that? Fine. Fine! You really bug me sometimes. You don't have a girlfriend at the moment. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I was never very comfortable around women. Mm -hmm. You seem to be pretty comfortable with me. What do you see in me, anyway? I see in you exactly what Jimmy Stewart saw in Jean Arthur. In? Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Did they end up together? Hmm. I'd like to see that sometime. Porque él dijo que no lo podía pagar y no solo eso, sino que estaba estaba well, he knows if, if she's got the painting, she's the woman in the wheelchair. I see the painting. I understand the parts when they're not talking. <laughs> She says, 
If you can paint, I can walk. Shop. I ordered us some breakfast. You know, great sex always, always makes me hungry, darling. Lucy! Ah! It's me! Open the door! Open the door right now! What's he doing here? I had to call his brother's car! I said, great sex makes me hungry right in front of him. He would never even touch me. Nothing. I'm supposed to be a virgin. You are? Oh, my God, you're going to be sick. I'll handle this. Oh, Albert. Lucy, what's going on in there? Oh. Albert, remember, he's trained to kill. <clears throat> Lucy! Bink? Who are you? A uh, lot's happened since you saw Lucy last. I asked you who you were, you be. Please put me down, Bink. I'm obviously not going to hurt you. I said, put me down. I'm Albert Brodsky, and I was hitchhiking in Indiana on my way to California, and uh, Lucy was kind enough to give me a lift. He was drowning in a rainstorm. Yes, I was, and, and Lucy saved my life. And, well, to tell you the truth, Bink, we were drawn to each other from the very start. And now, well, I'm in love with her. Are you in love with me? Think. Lucy. Think. Think. I'm, I'm calling off our engagement. If I marry you, I don't think either one of us would be very happy. Lucy. I know that I wouldn't be a good wife to you. I don't take orders that well. These, these past few days with Albert, I've realized that you and I aren't very close. You don't even know that I write children's stories. I'd like to be a writer one day. I really would. And if I married you, I don't think I'd ever do it. And, and that's how people get sick. You know, they, they never do what they really want, and, and they, they give themselves diseases. And, and you know something what? else that really bothers me as long as we're having this discussion is that I never liked the fact that your stupid car meant more to you than I did. Don't call my car stupid. Goodbye, Bink. Send my apologies to your folks, please. Very romantic, Mr. Brodsky. Now, how soon after that was Casey born? The following winter, December 11th, 1975. Now tell me, please, Mr. Brodsky, how long did you teach at UCLA? A little over four years. And did you spend much time with your daughter during those years? Yes, I did. Of course I did. I spent a lot of time with her. And what prompted you to stop teaching, Mr. Brodsky? Well, when I was at UCLA, I used to invite guest lecturers from the film industry to my class. One day, I invited David Kessler. He's a producer. Glad you can make it, kid. David, I, I'd like you to meet my wife. We got to talking after class. He was impressed with my knowledge of film and invited me to his house for a screening of his latest picture. All right, now we can settle it. This kid is a walking encyclopedia. I saw a movie on The Late Show last night with Freddie March and that blonde dame, uh, the one that Gable went with you. Nothing sacred? That's it. Nothing sacred. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who else was in it? Now listen to this. Uh, Walter Connolly, Charles Winninger, uh, Sig Ruman. Slapsy Maxi Rosenblum, former <laughs> light heavyweight champion of the world. It'll make a great remake, wouldn't it? Great? Well, I don't think so. It wasn't exactly state-of-the-art filmmaking to begin with. Besides, it, it was remade, wasn't it? Uh, Janet Lee, Jerry Lewis, 1954. Oh. You know, Ben Hecht wrote that screenplay in a four-day trip on the Super Chief across the United States. It was pretty good for four days. Well, you find this kid. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? I write children's books. And none of them have been published yet, so I'm 
doing a little typing at home just to help out. We also have a baby. Well, <laughs> she's not a baby anymore. She just turned three. Do you have kids? Yeah, but I'm not into parenting right now. Oh. Well. I think you'll like this. It's by William Shakespeare. Yeah. I said, and we have sets by uh, Michelangelo. I said, and that's not bad. And we have a score by Mozart. He said, I like this. I like this. I better read. He said, no, wait a minute. You see, God's got this girlfriend. That's very funny. Hi. How you doing? Oh. Fine. Good. I guess. Hi, sweetheart. Okay. Having fun? Fabulous. Party. Good. I, I guess going out with David, you get to see a lot of movies. Oh, huh? yeah. Especially when his wife's away. David loves screening. She hates them. David's married? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just celebrated their 35th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Where is she? Skiing, I think. No, at a health spa or something. I don't know. She loves to travel, so they're never together. I think that's why they've lasted 35 years. All right, kids. Show time. Anybody want anything before we start? Uh, okay. Great. Let's start with a pop. Yay! Yay! I adored it, darling. It's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It's gorgeous. I'm going to buy Okay, good night. Big hit. Big hit. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. David, thank you very much for having us. It was very nice to meet you. Dinner was delicious. Stay and have a little ice cream. There you are. Good night. That was great. Thanks, David. Thanks, nice you. See you in the morning. So what didn't you like about the movie? No, no, we liked it, didn't we, honey? Mm. We liked it a lot. Yeah, it was real cute. Adorable. <laughs> Bad liars. How refreshing. <laughs> I am really interested in your opinion. Now, what do you think is wrong with it? <clears throat> well, a lot. For instance? Well, for one thing, it's cut like a drama and it's a comedy, right? Yeah, it's supposed to be. You think the problems are fixable? Sure, if you could recut the film. I can do anything I want. Okay. I think your director lost you at least ten good jokes. He cuts on the punchline. I've never seen anything like it. And he mangled the performances. I mean, I saw where the actors were trying to go, but as soon as I'm about to be moved, he cuts. So I'm not laughing, I'm not crying. You know, Orson Welles said, that film is the most emotional medium in the world. I think he's right. People don't like to leave a theater feeling empty. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Well, it's getting late. Listen, it's a fine film. You know, I see things in pictures that no one else would ever notice. I'm sure it'll be a big hit. What if I turn the picture over to you? Do you think you can fix it for me? Well, I'm awfully busy right now, sir. I'm, I'm working on a new book. Post-war westerns, 1946 through 1952. It's a very complex subject. Takes up all my free time. <laughs> You're absolutely charming. I'm not interested in your free time, schmuck. I want you to come work for me. I'll double your salary. Think about it. I want you to start Monday morning. Well, look, I, I, I just think that it would be very good for us. You can't deny that. Oh, Albert. You continually misunderstand me. Yes, I agree. It would be great. We could do a lot with $500 a week. You could buy the BMW. We could get a housekeeper. We could... Which would give you time to write. Do you know how many young directors David Kessler has given their start in this business? If I do a good job for him, maybe someday he'll give me a chance to direct. <laughs> I mean, that's the reason I came out here to start with. It is? Come on. Oh, hi, Punky. Oh, honey, oh. did we wake you up? Uh, mm. Drink water, okay. It's just the thought of you working for this Kessler, a guy with a... a wife and a girlfriend and a mansion and... I don't want to turn into these people. How are we going to turn into these people? Well, I don't know how it happens. Maybe it's something in the Perrier water. 
Oh, take the job. No, take it. You're right. It'll, it'll be good for us. I'm overreacting. It's a great opportunity. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Casey, too. Oh, yes, Casey, too. Albert worked for David Kessler for the next two years. He became Kessler's right hand, his left hand, and the son he never had. Albert bought the BMW he wanted. We hired a housekeeper, and I enrolled in real estate school. And Albert was right about Kessler. He did offer him a chance to direct a movie. I remember the summer afternoon that Kessler first brought up an American romance. I tell you, it's a great story. An older man thinks he's dying. And then he falls in love for the first time with a 25-year-old girl. Finally, something to live for. You know, I tried to get the story made with Bogey and Bacall. Really? 35 years I've worked on this project. I've had over 20 writers on it, some of the greats. Why don't you take a stab at it? If you can make it work, you can direct it. I remember Albert's answer as if it were yesterday. No problem. No problem. What am I, nuts? Casey, will you hurry up? We have to leave in five minutes. I'm coming, I'm coming. Where's my hand at? In the living room. How's it going? Great, great. You got a minute? Well, she has to be in the gym class in 15 minutes, and I still have to pick up Todd and Laura live. That's all right. I want to read you something. Oh, good. No, I'd love to hear it. Uh, excuse me, what are you doing in my purse? I need lip gloss. Oh, no, you don't. I need that. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Go ahead. Interior of a taxi, day. It's drizzling. The taxi drives down a suburban street. In the back seat is a beautiful young woman, Rebecca Tyler. Her eyes are closed. The driver... What are you doing? I'm hot. Honey, would you put that back on, please? And go sit in the car for me. Thank you. I'm listening. Her eyes are closed. Right, her eyes. The driver says, <clears throat> where are you from? Rebecca says, here, but I haven't been home in a long time. The driver says, what's the occasion? She says, my mother's getting married. Well, that's all I have so far. I have a terrific idea for a shot. Start inside the taxi. Well, I like starting in the taxi. What? I don't know what that is. Well, this may be stupid, but why don't you just stay on the driver and hear Rebecca's voice and, like, maybe shoot it from her viewpoint. And looking out the window, you know, and you could see kids playing where she used to play and then when you go to rebecca's house you haven't really seen rebecca yet you know uh -huh, uh -huh. also i don't know if i've mentioned why rebecca's coming home why well let the story unfold a little more slowly you know it's her mother's wedding once you get inside the house oh i don't know your way is probably better after i drop her off i'm going to the market and then i have to go to the vacuum place and then I've got my class, and then I'll be home. Come on, let's go. Okay, sweetie. Uh, there's chicken in the fridge in case you get hungry. Lewis. Lewis. Could we work together a little this afternoon? I have to study for my real estate exam. I just think that the pressure's starting to get to me a little. If you could just work with me for a couple of hours, help me get back on track. I'd really appreciate it. Come on, you are the writer in the family. We worked that afternoon, and the next afternoon, and the next, and the next. Finally, Albert just came out and asked me to write with him. When we started writing, it was early summer. We finished right after Christmas. Maria, did you have her dinner? Let's see. Thank you. Good night. Good night.
kidding. Look who we hug. Real hard. I'll never love anybody in my life the way I love you. Kessler said our script was one of the best he'd ever read. We shot the movie that spring. Suddenly, the best times of our lives were about to change. breaking house records. Huh? You know, I, I never, never expected this. Well, how's the audience? Just like last night. They applauded when she left. They're laughing in all the right places. <laughs> what are you doing? I am figuring out how much we're going to make, dear. Oh. Eight foreign, mm -hmm. four for the TV sale, two for ancillary rights. Did you order me something? Uh-huh. Let's see, divide that in half, of which we have 5%. Oh, you know, Kessler's going to make a bloody fortune out of this picture. <laughs> Ooh, what's this? Uh, for Monsieur Brodsky, from Monsieur Ballantine. Paul <laughs> <clears throat> oh, Brodsky, it's nice to see you again. Thank you. Suddenly, Albert was Hollywood's new darling. Not only was the movie a box office smash, but the reviews were phenomenal. Newsweek called it a masterpiece. The New Yorker said it was a landmark in movie history. And Time called Albert the director of his generation. What a nice guy. Who is he? I have no idea. There's Albert Brodsky. Where? Right there, with the girl. Five percent of seven and a half million. How do you multiply on this thing? Ah, wait, here we go. Well, what do you think? Any price tags on me? No. If, if you didn't know me, would you think I was wearing contact lenses? No. Would you open the door? It's kind of hot in here. Did I tell you about the guy I met in the commissary yesterday? I was with David, and he said, I'd like you to meet Albert Brodsky. And the man gasped. I swear to God, he gasped when he heard my name. Gee, that's great. So we want the key. She's doing it again. Eh, uh, I said not a papacita. Stop it. I want you to speak to us in English, please. Por qué? Yo no quiero. Well, we want you to. Lo siento. Casey, honey, we're going away for two weeks. We'd like our last words to be in English. Por favor. Yo no hablo inglés, mamacita. Lo siento mucho. This is my fault. I'm not with her enough. She's getting me back. She just feels a little neglected, that's all. Yeah, and what do we do to make her feel better? We go away for two weeks. Oh, Maria, did you see my tux shirt by any chance? Is it packed? Your tuxedo shirt? Yeah. Oh, see. Good. Would you make me a quick glass of iced tea before I go? See. Lucy, call the office and make sure they've got a car waiting for us when we get to camp. Hey, do it yourself. I don't work for you. What's the matter with you? Sometimes I wish we'd never made this stupid movie. What? This hasn't been the greatest year of your life? Yes. In some ways. It's also been like the worst year of my life. What are you telling me? That you don't like your new house? That you don't like your wrote the biggest picture of the year? That you don't like that finally we got a little clout? We? What we? Oh, you're just upset because I'm getting all the accolades. Yeah, well, so would you be if you did half the work and no one ever mentioned your name. Every interview I do, I, I tell them, you lay down the script. Hey, pal, I did more than lay it down. You couldn't write a word without me. This is like Bing's car being stolen. It is not my fault. They're giving me all the credit. Well, maybe I don't get any credit because I'm a woman. Oh, well, now you're a feminist. Please, Lucy, don't do this to me, OK? Look, why don't you just go to Cannes without me? What is the matter with you? I don't like you anymore, OK? I don't like how possessed you are with your movie and your clothes and your contacts and your clout. It's enough already. Or
I want something else out of my life, Albert. I want some romance. I want some fun. I want to be like we used to be. Well, I don't. The child emancipation case of Brodsky versus Brodsky and Brodsky closed its second week of testimony today. Sources close to Lucy Van Patten Brodsky say that Monday's testimony will include the name that everyone familiar with this case has been waiting for. That name, of course, Blake Chandler. More on that part of the story now from entertainment editor Rex Reed. Rex. Thank you, Kelly. After the phenomenal success of an American romance, Albert Brodsky joined the ranks of such superstar directors as Francis Ford Coppola, Peter Bogdanovich, and Steven Spielberg. Brodsky was, as they say, hot. His only problem was what to do for an encore. He and his then-wife and co-scriptor, Lucy Van Patten Brodsky, found an obscure French novella entitled La Vision de Gabrielle, the story of an artist's model who inspired the Impressionists. This, of course, became the hit film Gabrielle. Now, every star and would-be star across two continents vied for the coveted role of Gabrielle, but Albert Brodsky was looking for a new face. Enter Blake Chandler. but she's too old for Gabrielle. We need that young, sexy, gorgeous, fabulous looking, you know? We need a face you could die from. Listen, could I call you right back? Albert just walked in. Okay, thanks. Please call if you're gonna be two hours late, okay? We're starving. Betsy called, and David called twice from New York. He's at the Sherry. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Pumpkin. Where have you been? You look funny. I was driving around thinking, and I, I uh, stopped to get a Coke at this hot dog stand, and well, there was a girl there, and I took one look at her, and I just knew she was Gabrielle. You're kidding. She's incredible. She's perfect. She is the character. Well, great. We'll test her. What do you want to drink? <sighs> she wouldn't test. Oh, well, what are you going to do? You know, she sells hot dogs for a living. I wouldn't exactly be upset. I hired her, Luce. Hi. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Hmm. This is great. I haven't had a decent meal in months. How long have you been working at this hot dog place? Oh, for about three months, I guess. Before that, I was going with this guy, Giorgio. He said he wanted to marry me. But he was so sick. I mean, just because I wouldn't go to Acapulco with him for the weekend, he tries to strangle me. You can still see the choke marks on my neck. See? That's how I met Waldo and Doug. The guys who own the hot dog stand. They saved my life. When I jumped out of the car the night Giorgio tried to kill me, I was right in front of the hot dog stand. Doug and Waldo saw the whole thing. And since I didn't have anywhere to go, Doug and Waldo took me in. I'm not going to get out of their place soon. I'm getting married. Waldo and Doug? Yeah, I'm going to be their maid of honor. Blake, um, I don't know how much Albert told you about our film, but... <laughs> well, <laughs> he told me a little in the car, but... He kept losing his train of thought. He was... So nervous with me driving. <laughs> driving what? Your Mercedes. She drove the Mercedes? <laughs> she never drove one before. <laughs> Casita, Malcolm's on the phone. I'll be right back. Malcolm's her boyfriend. Since when? Since they did their art project together two weeks ago. My God, he's all she talks about. Where have you been? I've been working. That's what I do. I work. We all work. Did I miss anything? Finish your dinner. Blake, do you know uh, anything about the period of our film? Turn of the century Paris, the Impressionists, 
Well, I, I know a little. Like, a girl, sort of, with her hair like, like this. Oh. Hello to you. Did I tell you? So, what's your schedule like? We've got a lot of work to do and not a lot of time to do it in. I'm totally loose. All I have to do is quit my job and find a new place to live. Albert felt if Blake moved in with us, we could work with her day and night and transform her into Gabrielle. Frankly, I wanted to transform her into an apartment down the street. But I thought maybe Albert was right, and I owed it to him to give it a try. You see, unconsciously, Gabrielle knows that when Henri paints her and his brush strokes the canvas in his mind, he's actually stroking her flesh, which he knows he can't do, and that frustrates him excites her. Now, I want to be able to feel that excitement. I want to be able to, to see you almost begin to tremble. That's good. I'm not happy lately. No, don't start, Luz, please. We never used to act this way. We never used to be distant or bicker. I feel like my mother. But right, you can tell me this is Blake's fault again, right? Oh, Albert, you have to admit, ever since she came into our lives... What? Jesus, Mr. Defensive, I'll tell you. She's changed our lives, okay? How? How? Well, we're never alone, for one thing. And you never touch me when we are. Well, we haven't been that romantic in a long time. You're telling me. Yesterday, I found a cobweb on my diaphragm. God, you're so sorry. Sorry. It's just that sexually, I was hoping that things would get better between us. Not worse. Sometimes I think you're in love with her. Oh, come on. I'm in love with Gabrielle, not Blake. That's the way I work. I can't help it. Wasn't I the same way in American Romance with Rebecca? Rebecca didn't live with us. Do you think this girl would be doing half as well as she is if we didn't work with her day and night? You're right. Everything's fine. Okay? Is that what you want me to say? Everything is fine. Sorry to bug you guys, but I couldn't sleep. I don't know how to say this, but for the first time in my life, I really feel like I'm part of a family. I think you're both such incredible people. <clears throat> Lucy, I admire you so much. I never met a woman like you. You've got a great kid and a beautiful house. You're a fantastic cook and a brilliant writer <laughs> and a good friend. I love you both so much. Well, that's all. I just want you to know how much I appreciate everything you've done for me. Apologize. I'm nuts. She's a great kid. Good night. Oh, 
Gabriel, ça c'est parfait, ne bougez pas. Ah, c'est beau ça. Cut it, cut it, please, cut it. Did I do something wrong? No, you're terrific, honey, you're terrific. Reggie, it's me. put a double on that 10K. I think it's the blocking. Let me just think for a second. There aren't any sparks between them. There's no heat, there's no chemistry. Something about it doesn't seem too real to me. Yeah. I don't know what it's yeah. Well, the reality is that Gabrielle would be nude. This is a cheat. Nude? What do you mean, nude? Frontal nudity is an R. I don't want to mess with the ratings. It's the difference between a scene that works, David, and a scene that doesn't work. Come on, Lucy, it rings the bell. Think she'd do it? I don't know. Let me ask her. Uh, don't pressure her. She's just a kid. Can I have her, please? Works for me. Like, don't forget, in the scene we're doing tomorrow, that Gabrielle is still a little scruffy. No nail polish, no earrings. And she's still real intimidated by Henri. Yes, thank you. And a little more tea, please. Also, honey, I've been thinking about that scene where Gabrielle has the baby, and I want to rewrite the dialogue before you shoot it. Also, I think we should try it with rain against the window. I think it would play better if Henri comes in a little wet. Nothing's forever. Five out of every eight marriages end in divorce. Now we're statistics. So what? I always figured we'd never last. Do you want this, please? Uh, no, you can have it. Fine. You're incredible, Lucy. I'm a grown up, Albert. You tell me you're in love with Blake. What am I supposed to do? Kill myself? Throw myself off the Hollywood sign. I'll live. Let's not be sad. We had nine good years. The best. Obviously not the best. But we did have our good times. Here's your sweater. I had it dry clean. You're so thoughtful. Goodbye. Is it something I did? I won't be fresh anymore. I promise. <laughs> I have no life. I have no husband, no home. This isn't my street anymore. What am I supposed to do now? Go to singles bars, get new clothes, look hot? No. Oh. That bimbo stole my husband. They had an affair. Probably in my bed or my sheets. Sorry. I drank their lover's wine out of glasses I stood in line to buy. Who's gonna take care of us now? Most parents get divorced. Really, Mom? I know my friend's parents are married. So what is that? Good? This wasn't supposed to happen to us. Oh, where am I driving? My mom and I spent that night at our corner. The next day, we got ourselves a little apartment. My mom had some in the pocket for Gabrielle, but she sold her part early so we could afford to live. Then when Gabrielle came out, they made lots of money. 
My mom didn't make anything. My dad and Blake got real rich and moved into a mansion in Beverly Hills. My mom didn't want to have anything to do with my dad. She said he was a worthless human being who didn't deserve to know us. <laughs> I guess I won't lean into it. That would be a good idea. Now, Casey, after your parents got divorced, how often did you see your dad? Whenever he could see me, mostly on weekends. And would you say you remained close with your father? No. 